Hello, and welcome to Writer's Group Therapy. I'm Tom. And I'm Roshni. We're writers helping writers with whatever writing ailments you might have. Whether it's related to your craft or your career, we can help. Are you ready for your session? The The doctors doctors are are in. in. Hi, Roshni. Hey, Tom. How's it going? It's going great. Read any good books lately? Read any? I'm gonna. I did. I read a, a really good book. Um, I'm gonna give you a test, though. I'm gonna ask you. Uh, I'm gonna give you a line from it, and you have to tell me who wrote it. Okay. Okay. It's uh, the road to hell is paved with adverbs. Oh gosh. Oh, I don't know. I I don't even know who said the original version of that. So I definitely don't know who said the current one. <laughs> oh well, that was Stephen King. Uh, he says that in his book on writing, uh, a memoir of the craft, which I didn't even know Stephen King wrote a book about writing. It's supposed to be like one of the top books on writing. Like everybody recommends it. I have yet to read it, though. I was recommended it to by a writer, producer, actor that I had a I got to do a little script breakdown with a um, an actor about one of my scripts through the Get It Made program. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm glad he recommended it because it was really good. I just read it over the last you know week or so. and. You've never read it there yourself, have you? No, I haven't. So just to just to like give you a little outline, um, it's kind of broken up into three parts. The first part is kind of about him becoming a writer. So it's a lot of a little autobiographical stuff. Kind of some of it's out of order, but it's, you know, about the things in his childhood and his growing up and then in his adult life and how they affected his writing and and both the process of writing and the ideation of writing. And then the second part is kind of more of his luxury kind of part on how to write. Um, but he's really light on it. I mean, he was an English teacher, but he's he's pretty practical about it. He he doesn't get to, you know, lecture to, um, you know, step one, step two, step three. He's more of a write, just write it and then fix it later kind of person. And then kind of towards the end, it gets into... Um, uh, he talks a little about the business. He talks about, you know, agents and, and then he gives like a list of recommended books. He recommends reading. He's a big proponent of reading. He says, if you want to be a writer, you have to do two things above all others, read a lot and write a lot. And he reads like 60, 80 books a year. He says, dang, must be nice. (laughs) Well, I guess his job is writing. So he can spend four to six hours a day reading um, and writing because that's his job. It's his full time job. But he says, like, you know, for a goal, like his goal is like to write three pages a day, which is about 2000 words, which his books run, he said, an average 180,000 words. So it takes him about three months to write a book. That is quite a lot. I've used that three pages a day thing with screenwriting actually as kind of a goal, because if you do that, you'll have a script in, you know, a month to a month and a half. I tend to do uh, the word count. I find it easier. So I think for me, obviously, I'm not writing in his genre. He's writing adult horror or adult fantasy, which you can get away with high word counts like that. Um, I'm in the like 80,000 range or so for YA. So I I think I did the math and I was like, okay, if I do like minimum a thousand words a day, I can probably knock it out in like three months or so. Better if I can do like higher, like two to three thousand words a day. Yeah. So. But yeah, it's I don't know. There's something satisfying, though, when you do the word count and then you look at the end of the day and you're like, oh, I did do 2000 whatever words. You just feel really good about yourself. Yeah. I mean, he's really big on the setting the goal and then mm-hmm. um, and then closing the door and you don't open it until you finish your goal. Until those until as he says, you have those words on paper or a floppy disk. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> what year was this written? So they didn't uh, update it, huh? (laughs) Well, it was he he started writing it in 1997, but it didn't publish till 2000 because he had a little problem with a van hitting him while he was taking a walk one day, (sighs) and um, he didn't finish it until he was in recovery from that that little accident of his. He, which he details in great detail in a section of the book. He put a chapter in, you know, towards the end, talking about not only just about what happened to him, but how how it affected his writing and how he his writing how he came back to writing afterwards, which is really interesting. Wow. Yeah. Uh but he's really big on the uh um you know having like a very um isolated place, like eliminate all the distractions. No phone, TV, video games, close the curtains so you can't even see what's outside while you're writing. 
So he's mm-hmm. very big on, on, you know, being in, in, in the right mental state and, and closing that door. In fact, he says he, that closed door metaphor he used is, is not, is not just for the physical space, but he also says you should write your whole first draft with the door closed in quotes, mm-hmm. you know, meaning you don't show it to anybody else. You just write it and then you, you don't stop. You just kind of go through it. And then, you know, then you can open the door when you start to share it with people. He sounds like he would be a big proponent of. So one thing, and I guess I'm lucky I learned this early on in my creative career. But when I was doing songwriting in Nashville, so when I went down to Nashville the first time, I would write songs just kind of, which I think a lot of musicians and and people in general, when they create, they do it when they're inspired, right? Oh, I'm in the shower. I'm going to write down this lyric or whatever, right? But you don't like sit down and make creativity a discipline. And I was so surprised when I went down to do my first album, I had a handful of songs and then my producer's like, okay, we're going to spend a week in pre-production. And they basically did just that. They locked me in a room with different songwriters, you know, and we would start at nine. And by three o'clock, we had at least one, if not more songs that were like radio worthy. And I was amazed that I'm like, I always thought creative, I always thought creativity was something that happens when you're inspired. No, it's a discipline. And I learned from working with these guys in Nashville to make it a discipline. So it kind of sounds like Stephen King is the same way about mm-hmm. that. Like, you know, make it a discipline as well as when yeah. you're inspired. Yeah. And that's one thing I like about the, the get it made program. I mean, it's cause there's, they have so many things going on. There's log line contests, synopsis, breakdowns, table reads. So I'm always in doing something, even if I'm not writing at that moment, I'm always doing mm-hmm. something in, in the space, you know, you know, practicing my, uh, craft in, in whatever way I can. That's awesome. So he's big on that. Um, he says, oh, when he was asked the secret of his success, he said it was um, that there were two two things. One, he stayed health, healthy physically until he got hit by a van um, and he stayed married. So I have to work on that part. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I forgot where I, I read it. It might have been like one of those Instagram kind of uh, inspirational things. But they said, actually, the best life hack you can do is marrying well. And they didn't necessarily mean like marry rich. They meant marry somebody who's really like your true partner, who really gets you, who will support you when you're down, you know, because you don't want to marry someone who, you know, drains your life away or like who doesn't understand what you're trying to accomplish or, you know what I mean? Like you really need a strong partner. And that is the best life hack because you're with that person 24 seven, hopefully for the rest of your life. And it can either be heaven or it can be hell. So choose wisely. And I was like, that's actually really it's a good way to think about it, you know? He talks about Tabitha, his wife, a lot in the book. Um, they met in college, um, got married, you know, in college. And, mm-hmm. you know, and they kind of struggled together, you know, in those early years. And But she was she was um, really supportive and really, you know, liked his writing and was would give him honest feedback about it. Um, in fact, he kind of owes her really big because he... Um, uh, he wrote his first draft of Carrie, you know, the book that be kind of kind of uh, was his first published novel, actually, and became a movie and all that. The, uh, now, a, I think a second and then a second movie, uh, a sequel or and not a, a sequel and a musical. And, and musical. he actually threw it away. <laughs> he yeah. he didn't like it. He wasn't happy with it. Um, and his his Tabitha found it in the trash and dusted off his cigarette smoke because he smoked a lot back then and read it and thought went to took it back to him and said, you have to, you have to finish this. You have to do this. And he, he said he didn't like the characters cause he didn't understand high school girls and all that, that stuff. And which is where he got the idea from because some girls in his school were teasing another girl about her period and throwing tampons. And that's where the blood comes from. You know, she said she'd help him with that part cause she knew what high school girls were like. <laughs> and it, it turned out to be a good thing that, that she, she found that in the trash. Now, I can't remember. Is his wife also a writer or what does she do? Did he say? So, yes, um, Tabitha King, uh, his wife, is a writer. Right after college, she worked at a Dunkin' Donuts, but she actually was also doing work study at the library where they met and fell in love and the whole thing. But she has published eight novels and two works of fiction. Um, You might be interested because five of her novels are a fictional series set in the community of Nods Ridge. So, you know, she's a series writer. Um, but she's not horror, right? She's a different genre. Well, actually, um, I didn't. I, or is she also horror? Sh- 
She's also horror. She actually wrote an oh. episode of um an episode of a TV show called Kingdom Hospital. It was a short-lived series, like one season on ABC, that was about a haunted hospital. That she she actually wrote huh. that, and That's I actually cool. watched that series. So you, wow! I never realized she wrote on it. Your six degrees moment, right there. Yeah, yeah. She's also a poet, cool. so she's written a bunch of poet poems too, oh, wow. and short, short stories. So she is a writer, and um, she's also an activist, a philanthropist, and she served on um, the board of the Bangor Public Library and the main public broadcasting system. So she's quite, um, you know, has her own stuff she does. So, so when she saved her husband's manuscript for Carrie. She knew what she was talking about. She did. Yeah. She, <laughs> yeah. Good, good person to have around. Yeah. Sometimes you can argue for like a couple who are both creatives. And then sometimes it's better when like one is not, you know what I mean? Like one's in a normal uh, yeah, job and I, one's in a, yeah. I think you did a good job. Your, your husband is not a writer. <laughs> He's not that even was, related, not even, re- not even related to Hollywood. I think, you, I think you, 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 you got that one right. Yeah. I, I did that one deliberately. <laughs> He doesn't talk yeah. about that in particular, but um, but I think uh, having someone who understands what you're trying to accomplish and is supportive of it is probably a very important thing. For sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I got to I got to find me some, myself a, a supportive wife who uh, can support my screenwriting d- dreams. Complimentary, but not competitive. Right. The that's a good way thing. to put it. Yeah. yeah. That's a very and good I think way that's with, with any like relationship, business, friendship, whatever. You want people who are complimentary, but not competitive with you. Yeah. Hmm. Tweet that, everybody. There you go. <laughs> what else really stuck out to you? What else really stuck out to me? He, he had this thing where he talked about, um, you know, bad writers, good writers, great writers. He said, um, while it is impossible, this is a quote. While it is impossible to make a competent writer out of a bad writer, and while it is equally impossible to make a great writer out of a good one, it is possible, with lots of work, dedication, and timely help, to make a good writer out of a merely competent one. (laughs) And I kind of felt like he was talking to me here. (laughs) Oh, no. No, because, uh, you know, I, I think that there are those really, there's the Dickens and the Shakespeare's, you know, the geniuses who could, you know, anything they write with people would love. But, you know, sometimes a bad writer is just always going to be a bad writer. You you might be able to make a bad, you might, I, I don't, I don't want to say that that's true all the time. I think if somebody really wants to do it, they can, but even he in his own, in his, in the book critiques some other famous writers and talks about their issues, you know, like this writer, you know, doesn't even use complete sentences or this one's too long winded, you know, but they may have been very successful, which, which is the point is that if you're, if you can be a good writer and and, and you can write stories that people want to read, you can be successful as a writer. Well, but part of that is popularity mm-hmm. versus talent. I think what he might be getting at is talent. If you don't have basic talent, you can only go so far. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, part of it is, you know, different eras have different, like they like different styles of writing or they like different styles, but it's true in anything. Now I'm going to make this broad, anything creative. I have met people. I've done a lot of creative careers. I was in photography. I was a musician. I'm an actor. I'm a voiceover artist. And now I write, you know, like I do a lot of creative careers in every single field. I have met people that I'm like, please, please do not quit your day job. You can't sing. You can't act. You can't whatever. And they're uh, trust me, like if if determination and drive could take them there, then they would be like A-listers. You know what I mean? But Mm -hmm. it's just not there. And I have been to very painful concerts where I'm like, but you can't sing. But you know what? You have so much drive and that's taking you pretty darn far. It's impressive, you know. So part of it is, you know, popularity and like, do people like this certain style? But I, I get what he's saying. Some people just aren't meant to do certain things. And that's not a bad thing. I am not meant to build a bridge. I am not meant to do surgery on you. That's <laughs> fine. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. No, it's, you know, that's what he says is sometimes popular writers weren't necessarily the best writers. It's just that the masses embrace their stories. So I thought that was, that was interesting. So, but you know, he's not trying to discourage people. <laughs> he's just, he's just trying to lay it out there. He, he, in his book, he's very matter of fact and just trying to say like, this is just how I see it. You know, he's not trying to say it. He's not trying to lecture or uh, 
or shoot people down necessarily. But speaking of story, uh, oh, I was going to tell you this because you, you'll love this. So, so he says that story consists of three parts, narration, description, and dialogue. And then he goes on to ask the, the question himself, where is the plot? And he says, nowhere. I distrust plot. He has two reasons. He says, our lives are largely plotless. Plotting and spontaneity of, are like incompatible with creation. Like you can't plot everything out and then expect it to be, in, you know, kind of, you know, holistically created. You know, like when he, like if you write like you do, like by, you know, the seat of your pants or your pantser, he's a pantser too. He sits down and he just writes and writes and writes and writes until it's all done. Because he feels like the story is telling itself. The characters are becoming the characters themselves. And if you try to figure that all out ahead of time, you lose that creation aspect of it. I can see that. And, you know, it also kind of makes me think, now I'm kind of curious if uh, Mr. King has ever taken improv classes. But, you know, you know how I tend to approach uh, writing, which we've talked about this before, is I'm like, these are the characters. This is their worldview. What happens if this happens to them? How do they react if this happens to them? You know what I mean? And like, that's kind of what I do with my characters, because that's kind of how life is, right? Like we have our set personalities. So what happens if, you know, you're really set in your ways and then you meet someone who's like absolutely insane and you have to be their new roommate, you know, like, okay, and then and then this and then this and then this. Right. So I can see what he's saying. Like, that is kind of how life is. It's more your personalities and your characters reacting to the world around them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he basically says that if he can't guess how the quote-unquote damn thing is going to turn out, then he's pretty sure that his readers will be, you know, kept in a state of anxiety. Like, they won't know either. So mm-hmm. so by by not knowing it himself, actually, he's he's making sure that his, his readers will also experience that unknowingness. I'd be curious, did he say how many drafts he goes through as a pantser? Uh, not many. Um, and maybe it's cause it's, he's Stephen King, but, um, two, maybe three. He's, he really doesn't do a lot of drafts. Wow. But that's, but that's him. So, I mean, yeah. I don't know what the editors are doing on, on, on their side, but. Oh, he also says, um, this is kind of related to that. He says a story is like a fossil and that each character and situation are, are, um, kind of you have to use the little brushes and the little tools to kind of whittle away at the stuff around them to to get to the 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 story and you can't rush it and you can't plot it because if you plot it you're kind of you're going to break the fossil you know you're going to go too fast and you're going to you're not going to get the real picture so it's kind of like taking your time to really understand it as you write it versus trying to you know figure it out ahead of time oh huh, that's interesting yeah yeah, he actually did plot out some books. Um, he says that his novels like Insomnia, un- oops, can't talk. Insomnia and Rose Matter are kind of stiff. He feels like they're hard, um, like they're trying too hard. And um, although he does like the Dead Zone, he says, which was which was plotted out. So, but most of his, almost all his other novels were not plotted. You know, it's funny. So I'll be honest, I've seen... The movies based on his books, but I actually did not pick up my first Stephen King novel until last year, which was Fairy Tale, which, hmm. by the way, is already picked up for rights. So coming to a theater near you, right? I'm sure it was before it was even published. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say his writing book was before. Um, obviously, I've read this this current book, and it was good, but it was interesting knowing that he is a pantser. I could kind of feel where the story was kind of like veering off into random places and then like getting back on track you know what I mean Mm -hmm. and it wasn't bad but it kind of made me wonder yeah it just kind of made me wonder like well first of all how they're going to translate it into a movie but also like was the editor just like no you're Stephen King it's cool you know or if they were like no you got to tighten up here a little bit Uh, have you read it yet or no fairy tale no i haven't read it yet okay i i I, i've read things like uh firestarter and what was the other one i read the dead zone i read Mm -hmm. because they're more sci-fi than they are horror Mm. because i was never a big horror fan growing up i mean i actually write some now but um i'm more more of a fan now than i was then Mm -hmm. but i think those two genres are you know are compatible but no i haven't read that one yeah, I mean, it, it's I picked it up because it isn't horror, and I'm not a big horror person either. 
But it's really, the book is definitely very much split into two parts, but you can, don't get me wrong, it's a good book. It's worth a read. I hope that there's some things in the movie that they pick up and delve into deeper that weren't in the book, which is surprising considering how thick it is. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I wondered, knowing how he approaches his writing, I'm like, were these plot points that they just were like, eh, we're not going to worry about it, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, I don't know. Obviously, he didn't talk about it in this book because this book was written first. This was way before, yeah. Yeah, yeah. he talks um, a lot about, you know, his toolbox is what he calls it. He, he is the metaphor of a toolbox. So he's got like, he focuses on like vocabulary, grammar, style. And, you know, like you said, narr- narration, description, dialogue. Those are his like main tools. He doesn't work with plot and outlining and, and stuff like that. He gets into other creative things later. But he doesn't even, you know, like a lot of writers talk about how they have to like know their characters inside out, like what's their favorite, you know, you know, flavor of chewing gum and and that kind of stuff. And he doesn't do that. So I can see that, too, because, I mean, even in real life, you don't necessarily know everything about a person. You know what I mean? You discover Mm -hmm. it as you get to know them. But even then, there's probably a good 50 percent or more you might not know because you didn't grow up with them or you didn't, you know, live with them or what have you. So, yeah, I can understand keeping some of your character a mystery, too. It seems like a lot of his characters come out of people he knew in his life, too. So they already have kind of a uniqueness to them Mm -hmm. versus creating character A, character B, character C, and then and then later trying to figure out how they're different. Yeah. His his big pet peeves are I think this is what I started with the adverb. Um, you know, being the, the road uh, to hell is paved with adverbs. He says the adverb is not your friend and that you should never use it in dialogue attribution. You know, like he said, you know, jokingly, that kind of thing. He says that he said and she said are totally fine and you can just use those. So wait, you're saying like he's not a fan of basically giving the reader a line reading. Yeah. No, I mean, it's yeah. supposed to come out in the dialogue. Yeah. And out of the character's personality. You know, he's very yeah. big on dialogue, you know, like yeah. your dialogue is really key. Um, it says more about your character than, you know, a description of your character can in some ways. Huh. But I mean, so, for example, like, let's say, all right, he said jokingly, uh, I don't know, fix the clock. Right. Let's say that. Let's say that's the sentence. But if you change it where it's like maybe you describe him being kind of goofy. And then he said, fix the clock. That's what you're saying. Based on context, the reader would be like, oh, yeah, he's joking. Mm -hmm. I guess so. Yeah. Um, You know, we talk about that in screenwriting, too, with parentheticals. People overuse those a lot. Like, it's kind of like directing to the actor, that kind of thing. Like, you're not supposed to do that in your scripts as much unless it really is apparent, like, what they're saying is extremely different from what you would expect them to be saying or how they would say it. Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of in that realm. And one thing Stephen King says is um, that he's uh, he's convinced that fear is the root of most bad writing. And I think and what he means by that is if you're afraid that your your reader won't understand what you're trying to get at, then you try to over explain it. Yeah, that makes sense. It's yeah. funny that you talk about the uh, parenthetical slash use of adverbs. I took a sketch writing class years ago, and I remember we actually analyzed a couple SNL scripts. Usually, nine times out of ten, interestingly enough, I don't know if it's a time constraint or what, they do not use parentheticals. Oh. They just don't. Well, yeah, I think um, they're going to rehearse it and practice it. So I think they're going to like, the characters are going to kind of dictate how things are said. So they don't really need to. I I don't think they really rehearse it that much as you think, honestly. I don't know the actual SNL like production schedule. So, hey, any listeners, if you work for SNL or SNL adjacent, let us know. But I don't know if you've ever noticed, they rely very heavily on teleprompter. So that tells me that they don't really rehearse as much as you think they would. I believe, I I think they get their scripts finalized. If they're shooting Saturday night, I think they get their scripts finalized maybe by like Friday. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So there's really not a lot of time to like sit down and have a nice rehearsal and blah, blah, blah. So, but I remember the, um, in the sketch writing class, they just said, yeah, like they, it's all actor's choice 
part and like I said, part of it also might be a time constraint. I don't have time to write a parenthetical because I just need to get the dialogue out and move on to the next <laughs> script. But right. you know, a lot of it was just it's all actor's choice. Hmm. Yeah. No, I I think that that's possible. Well, like when he works on a project, he says he starts and he doesn't stop or slow down until he absolutely has to. Like he writes every day. Otherwise, the characters get to be stale, you know, because then you lose their personalities. So maybe he, part of that is how he keeps it constant through the whole thing without having to attribute stuff because he's he's really focusing on keeping the characters fresh in his mind so that they're they're fresh on the page for the reader. You know, it's funny. Actually, I can totally get behind that. I have noticed that if I knock out a book within a few months, like if I sit down every day and knock out like my thousand words, my two thousand words, not only does the book get done, but it's a lot tighter. Whereas like if I put it away for too long, then I'm like, oh, where was I going with that? And it gets really and and you as my editor, you've probably felt it where you're like, what on earth? You know, they were going to point A and now they're at point X. What's happening? And it's because I put it down for too long and I mm, forgot. forgot. So I can understand that, like, yes, just at least for your first draft, just hammer it out, get it out. That's why things like NaNoWriMo are really good, because even if your first draft sucks, which they always do, at least you have that first draft of like everything connected, you know? Mm hmm. Cool. Yeah, no, I think you guys are on the same page there. So. I think, I think, let's see, uh, pronouns. That's a big topic these days. Uh, he says he hates and mistrusts pronouns. Every one of them is as slippery. Uh, what does he say? He says, every one of them is as slippery as a fly by night personal injury lawyer. So he doesn't like pronouns. He just uses. Wait, wait, what do you mean? Like, so he doesn't like to use them to refer to people. So he'd always be like, yeah. Tom walked across the room and then Tom put down the flowers on the table. Like, mm-hmm. he won't say he. Well, I, you know, it depends on how he's referring to the person, what per, if it's if it's first person or third person, you know, so he mm-hmm. keeps it, you know, fresh and and keeping, you know, so, you know, who's talking without even having to use the pronouns and stuff mm-hmm. keeps it. Flowing. Can I can I just say <laughs> and you know this also because we uh, we uh, co-lead a writer's group together and I'm also in a few other ones. I hate it, especially in scripts when people get coy. Mm. about who's speaking you know the Uh. mystery man walks in and you're like just say it's the dad it's fine nobody's like it's just for us reading so we know who it is you know and and i see it sometimes you know in a a lot of novels where they get really coy and you're like are you kidding me like one of my uh my my mentors um she has this really funny tiktok she's an audiobook narrator also and she talks about why is it so important to prep the audiobook? Because, for example, let's say you're doing a 300 page novel and you don't realize that the main character has a Russian accent until page 200 when suddenly <laughs> the author decides to say he said in his thick Russian accent. And you're like, what? Yeah. yeah. Don't play coy. I hate it. Mm-hmm. I hate it when they play coy. So, yeah. Right. Go, 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 Mr. King. I am totally with you on that. There you go. It's it's interesting. Well, on the the topic of dialogue in general, it's interesting because I've seen this in, in a, you know I've kind of pointed out a couple times in your writing. He says you must tell the truth if your dialogue is to have the residence and realism. To do otherwise would be cowardly as well as dishonest. And part of that goes to he got harassed for using you know kind of swears and stuff in some of his his writing, and he, he thinks you have to be really truthful about it to the character, like not all of the world is going to love your writing or your stories, but you have to be true to your characters, like what they're saying. And I think in a couple of times in, in some of the stuff I edited for you, it's almost like you, you were hedging, like you weren't sure if the person saying it believed it themselves. And so you were qualifying things a lot and it's like, don't qualify, just have them say it and, and not, you know, always hedge. You know, like the kind ofs and the sort ofs and that kind of thing. Oh, I get what you mean. Okay. But also that might be also a stylistic, you know, you have to decide, is it, is it the characters aren't sure or is it a stylistic? Because, you know, I'm reading a book right now where everyone says like every, four, you know, four words or something like yeah. sometimes it's a stylistic thing where people are like, you know, or kind of or whatever. So I, I get what he's saying, but yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, if it's contemporary stuff, you know, and, and it's 
that's the way they speak, then I guess that's fine. In general, I think he's trying to make characters more original and, and unique in that respect. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, I'll end with the story that I really liked that he told um, about misery. And that's the the, the story that um, about uh, Robert De Niro played the main character in the movie, who is a writer who has an accident and winds up in this cabin in the woods with this fan of his who holds him hostage and tortures him. Um, he actually had a dream that that happened to him on a flight to London in the 80s. And and it, it shook him so much that he couldn't sleep that night when they got to the hotel. And so he actually got up in the middle of the night and wrote 16 pages on a steno pad in a, in a room that the concierge showed him so he could get it out of his system because it, it just shook him. But that became that movie. Have you ever had that happen to you where, where you got an idea for one of your stories from a dream and then it just you couldn't stop thinking about it? Um, not a dream, although I do tend to write down my dreams just because the more you write them down, the more it helps you remember. So far, I've had, I think the weirdest things I've had are a lot of zombie dreams, but since I don't write horror, I'm not going to be writing those. (laughs) I don't know why I'm like, I'm like, I don't like horror. I don't watch zombie movies. And yet I'm having like all these zombie dreams. I'm like, okay, that was weird. weird. So if I ever do write a zombie novel, I've got a lot of material for that. Okay. yeah, I mean, I think you can just be inspired by like anything around, you know, I don't actually tend to write people I know into my books. So you're off the hook there. But um, but yeah, sometimes like people will just have a certain mannerism or like a certain event. I actually um, I was playing a video game the other day and like the backstory in that was like, I was just like, oh, my gosh, I love the freaking it was like a throwaway line. And I'm like, I love this backstory. I kind of want to like write a whole book around it. You know, I'm like, am I allowed to do that? Like, I don't know, you know, mm, yeah. but uh, sometimes just it's yeah. Art begets art. Well, I don't want to spoil any more of it. I think uh, everyone should check out on writing a memoir of the craft by Stephen King. I'm probably the last one to read it since it's been out for so long. But uh, you should definitely check it out. It's definitely worth a read. Lots of um, good advice and uh, I guess you call it encouragement. I think he's very encouraging in it. So check it out. I'll put the link to the book in the show notes. And otherwise, uh, follow us on Instagram and Twitter at WG Therapy and at writersgrouptherapy.com. And keep writing. <laughs>